I invite you to take your Bibles out and be open to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. We're studying the seven churches of Asia that are addressed by Christ here in Revelation 2 and 3. And we invite you to join us there in the second chapter of Revelation. We're blessed as we often are with visitors, so thankful for your presence here with us this morning. Revelation chapter 2. We've kind of done something rather un unorthodox. We've kind of worked backwards through the seven churches of Asia. So the one you normally begin with is the one we're ending with, and that is Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. And maybe even over this section of verses, you have, as I do in my Bible, the loveless church. That may be a bit harsh, that description, because it sounds like, well, this church didn't have any love at all. And I don't think that was the case as we read through it and study it. The point is they did get to a point where there was less love than they had previously, and Christ addresses that. But let's read the text together, Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so just seeing where these churches were located briefly, again, of course, we're talking about modern-day Turkey, if you were to look at a map today. But back in the New Testament time, this was known as Asia. Sometimes you'll see Asia Minor. And it wasn't all the churches of Asia, but seven of them that Christ addresses that were all located in this province of Asia. And so the church at Ephesus here on the, the coast of the Aegean Sea. And the next church that was, is addressed by Christ is the church at Smyrna, a persecuted church. Nothing of condemnation is said to this church. And then the compromising church, the church at Pergamos or Pergamum located here just north of Smyrna. And then the church at Thyatira, a church that was corrupt in chapter 2. And then moving into chapter 3, the church at Sardis that had a name that it was alive, but Christ says you're dead. And then the church at Philadelphia, along with Smyrna, the two churches of the seven where there's no specific condemnation, the faithful church. And then the final church addressed there at the end of chapter 3, the church at Laodicea, they were lukewarm. But the church in Ephesus, there really are some magnificent ruins that you can see today over in this area where the ancient city of Ephesus was at. Here is the magnificent library of Celsus in Ephesus. It was built in 135 A.D., so after the time of Paul and John. Uh, Pharaoh Jenkins, gospel preacher, one who's made many travels to Bible lands, he stated, the first time I saw this area in 1968, only the steps were visible. So think about that. First time he went just, just down here, all, all that had been uncovered so far uh, were these steps. And he said the Austrian excavators did a marvelous job of reconstruction between 1970 in 1978, it's estimated that the library that was there in Ephesus could hold between 9,500 and 12,000 rolls. The arch to the right leads to the ancient Agora. Agora was a gathering place of the people of the city. And so he says off to the right, in this picture, here's the, I think what he's referring to, the arch here and the, that leads off to the Agora. This is a group of Christians that 
went over to Ephesus and other places, obviously in Greece and Turkey, a couple of years ago in 2021 with uh, Leon Malden. Uh, pictured uh, here, you have what's called the Acardian Way. See this road here, and it would go all the way out to the Aegean Sea. And here up close at the front of the picture is the great theater. But the Arcadian Way, the main street of the Roman era of Ephesus, leading from the city's busy harbor uh, to the foot of the great theater. Ephesus was located in West Asia near the sea and at the mouth of the Kaister or Kaister River. And though it wasn't the capital, it was the chief city of the province. And it's interesting that river silt has, has so filled the ancient harbor that the ruins of the city are now four to six miles pushed inland. Ephesus derived its greatness from two sources, commercial trade and religion. It was the chief commercial city of the province and the center of the mother goddess worship of Western Asia. The goddess was known to the Greeks as Artemis and to the Romans as Diana. We read about Diana, right? In Acts 19, when Paul first comes, uh, well, on his third journey, when he spends the time that he does, a lengthy amount of time there in Ephesus preaching, we read about Diana. But Ephesus boasted a theater. We showed a picture of the ancient ruins of that that could accommodate 24,500 persons and the great temple to Diana, which was one of, at that time, seven wonders of the ancient world. And after years of archaeological research, the ruins of the temple were discovered in 1877 by J.T. Wood. One of the greatest seaports of the ancient world was at Ephesus, and thus, thus both by water and by land it stood at the crossroads for the world. Pergamos, as we studied previously, that, that was the capital of Asia Minor, but Ephesus was also important politically because it was one of the cities where the Roman uh, governor would come to hear trials. Ephesus was a free city. In other words, the Romans granted it the right of self-government. <clears throat> and so Paul came to Ephesus the first time on his way home from the second journey. Didn't spend long there, wanted to get to Jerusalem in time for the Pentecost, it says there. And, but then he returned on his third journey. And the apostles spent more time in Ephesus and Asia broadly, teaching the word of the Lord, Acts 19, verse 10. Mentions two years there that he spent. Later, when he met with the elders from Ephesus, he mentions how three years he had been with them. But he spent more time in Ephesus and in the area of Asia more than any other place recorded in the New Testament of Paul's travels and of his preaching. Remember Demetrius the silversmith there in Acts 19. He testified to the influence and the effect of Paul's preaching when he said that it was felt throughout almost all Asia. The churches in Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea were probably the fruit of the time Paul spent there in Ephesus. Paul left Timothy in that city on two occasions, we know, to correct certain false teachers. As we read in 1 Timothy 1.3, I left you in Ephesus that you would charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And tradition says that after Paul's death, the city became the home of John, the apostle, for many years. But what we know about the church at Ephesus, what we read about in Acts 19, what we read in Acts 20, and the, we have an epistle written to the church at Ephesus, right? Ephesians. But that this was a good church. And as also expressed in the Ephesian letter, written about 62 AD. In fact, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and this was part of the reading that Camden did for us a little while ago, commended the faith and the love of the saints there. In Ephesians 1 and verse 15. However, time has passed when we come to obviously the book of Revelation chapter 2 and a new generation of saints have come along and in form the church is obviously still strong, it's still sound, still stands for the truth, stands against error. But this church, Jesus Christ tells them you've left your first love. 
And so mechanical routine, outward form, is not the service that Christ wants from us. The Lord has no grandchildren. Perhaps you've heard that expression. Think about that. Children of God, we don't have grandchildren of God. Often second and additional generation churches have the kind of problems that face the church at Ephesus. And so let's turn our attention to the main text there, as we always do, after we give some background to these cities and to the church and its establishment, and certainly of the seven, we have a lot more information in the Bible about this church than any other of the seven. But let's look at the text here of Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We have, as we do with all these letters, Jesus Christ designating him in certain ways, describing him in certain ways. And all these self-designations of Jesus and the letters to the churches really are taken from descriptions of him found in chapter 1 of Revelation. But here he begins, of verse 1, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right? These things says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Seven is a term of completeness or perfection. We see it uh, used a lot, seven and ten, uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, the seven stars, if you look back at chapter 1 and verse 20, are said to be the angels of these seven churches. Now, as to who are these angels specifically, uh, no suggested, there's many views that have been suggested, but no, no suggested view really is completely satisfying, so we're not going to uh, belabor that point this morning. Also, Christ describes himself as he who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And so Christ walks among the seven golden lampstands. These lampstands back in chapter 1 and verse 20 are identified as the churches. And so if you look back at the verse right before we, you begin reading chapter 2, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Notice the church is, is not the lamp the light with a lampstand which holds up the light. And if Jesus is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, what does that imply? Well, it implies that he's observing the conditions of these churches. And that's why he will say to them, I know your works. I know your works. But he's walking in the midst of these seven churches. And notice these, there are seven separate lampstands. Each church is independent. Each church is autonomous. It's self-governing. And as we read in Revelation 2 in our study of the church at Thyatira, be reminded, as Christ says there in verse 23, that I am he, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. You know, that's sobering. It's sobering, I think. Obviously, Jesus knows everything about me individually and you individually, and whether our faith is genuine or not, whether our love for him is genuine or not, whether we have been growing or whether we have digressed in our faith and love. But he also knows about a church, doesn't he, as a whole. He knows the spiritual health of a, of a church, and we're reminded that as we've studied these seven churches of Asia. He, I don't... I don't do you think that's changed any of him being aware then and not now? Of course not. He's still the one who's the head of the church. He is the one that still uh, searches the minds and the hearts. And yes, on the day of judgment, we're going to give an account for ourselves. But it matters what we do, yes, individually as a child of God, but it matters also what we do and how we are as a group of Christians in a local church. We find a lot of commendation for the church at Ephesus. He says, I know your works, I know your labor, and your patience. The word toil, and the word toil is used instead of labor, I found in the 
the American Standard Version, and the Revised Standard Version, and the English Standard Version, and the New American Standard Bible. So m many of you in the audience probably have the word toil. New King James has the word, maybe King James, I believe, too, has the word labor. But toil, that Greek word indicating strenuous or wearying labor accompanied by patient enduring under such trying circumstances. But everything we read about the church at Ephesus, even many years have passed since its establishment by Paul going there to preach the gospel. This was an active, working congregation. They did not quit. They persevered even in times of difficulty. He also commends them. He says that you cannot bear those who are evil. He says you've tested those who claim, who say we're apostles. They showed up at Ephesus and claimed they were apostles and they're not. You found them to be liars, he said. You know, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul encountered this type of problem at Corinth. If you'll mark your place, hold your place here, please, in Revelation 2. But go back and look at this with me real quick over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just to be reminded of what Paul said here to the church at Corinth about this, this very matter, really. <clears throat> so 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. He says, but what I do, I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, he says in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 11, deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself also transforms. Uh, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Maybe you forgot about it, or maybe you weren't aware of this passage. But back at the time of the church at Corinth, which would be many years prior to, as we understand it, the book of Revelation, that this was a problem then. Men showing up, claiming to be apostles of Christ, and you can understand how damaging that would be if someone was accepted and they really weren't an apostle of Christ. They're, they're claiming then to be guided by the Holy Spirit to, to have, well, notice in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, uh, the test of, of an apostle would be his ability or inability to perform miracles. These were the credentials of apostleship. So you can test them and find out whether they're liars or not. Okay, 2 Corinthians 12 and, and, and verse 12, what does that say? Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So if they can't do that, of course it's through the laying on the apostles' hands, the gifts of the Holy Spirit were given, Acts 8, 18. Then you can find out rather quickly whether he was an apostle or not. Of course we know another qualification, you had to see the risen Lord, but you had to demonstrate you had that power given to you by God, by Christ, through the Holy Spirit. But that was one of the spiritual threats in the, at the church at Ephesus. Some showed up claiming to be apostles, and if it was really an apostle, then you need to listen to him because he's guided by the Holy Spirit and the things he's preaching to you, things he's doing, but they weren't. They found them to be liars. You know, when Paul spent those two to three years with the church in Ephesus. And he met, he met with the uh, elders from the church at Ephesus there in Acts 20, gave them final instructions. Remember, he had done a lot of, uh, of warning them through those three years, right? Years ago, let's say years ago, this is probably 20 years ago <laughs> or more, I did a sermon entitled, Don't Warn Me. Because I found an attitude among some brethren is like they just rather not know, kind of plug the ears about any kind of controversy or, or error or, or dealing with false teachers. And yet you come here to Acts 20, and what did Paul say? He said in, in, in verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. 
For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse or misleading things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now notice verse 31 in particular. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. What was Paul warning them continually about through those three years? Not that every sermon was that. But it was a consistent thing that you need to be aware that there's all these spiritual dangers, not only on the horizon from without, but also some from within. And as shepherds of the flock, you must protect your sheep from that. And so he did that with great emotion. It, it wasn't that, you know, here's my, my favorite sermons do. It was because he loved them and cared for them. He says, with tears. I did that night and day with tears. And so instead of the attitude of don't warn me, please warn me. Please help keep me safe through the teachings of God's Word and the Scriptures, the doctrine of Christ. You know, John, the writer of the book of Revelation, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, John had urged brethren to test the spirits. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. And isn't that exactly what Christ is commending the church at Ephesus for doing? That you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they're apostles. They did exactly what John said in 1 John 4, 1. You tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them to be liars. And this church maintained correct doctrine, didn't they? He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't address an error like at the church at Pergamos where they held to the doctrine of Balaam and they had those who held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, verses 14 and 15. And it wasn't like the church at Thyatira where they had those uh, who were following after the teaching and the influence of that woman Jezebel uh, who taught and seduced my servants to commit sexual immorality, eat things sacrificed to idols, that wasn't going on at the church at Ephesus. They were standing for the truth. They were maintaining pure doctrine. They were abiding in the doctrine of Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 John, rather, verses 9 through 11. And yes, as we've studied through these seven churches of Asia, I hope we've been reminded it does matter what we teach. It does make a difference what we believe and teach because when something is being held to that's false, Christ says that's wrong, he rebuked them, you need to repent of that. And when they took a stand and were, were, were not bearing with evil as the church in Ephesus, he commended them for that. And so we too must guard, as we read in 1 Timothy 6.20, we must guard against error. We must guard against false doctrine. Truth is what sets us free. Error certainly does not. It will cause us to be separated from our Lord. He goes on to say in verse 3, And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. You know, a trait of human nature is the tendency to, at some point, to grow faint, especially under hard work and pressure from without, or within, you know, how often in the advancing years of life do men and women who formerly were diligent in serving the Lord and, and the church retire, so to speak, from the Lord's work with the plea or excuse, you know, I, I, I carried the load in my younger years and now I'm passing the workload on to those who, who are younger and the vigor and strength of that age but is, but is there ever a time to grow weary? To retire and let others bear the brunt of the battle and carry the load that should be mine? No, never. I may not be able to do, you may not be able to do what you used to do at one time. And God knows that. The Lord knows that. But we don't get to a point and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of retired. I'm going to coast here. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 doesn't come across as a coasting mentality, does it? Therefore, my beloved, bear them, be ye steadfast and move will always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But in the midst of severe hardships, they had not ceased worshiping God, worshiping the Lord, serving the Lord, being faithful to Him. He commends them that, of that. You've persevered. You've had patience. You've labored for my name's sake. 
and you've not become weary. You know, when Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia, he said in Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 9, <clears throat> Galatians 6 and verse 9, and let us not grow weary while what? While doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And he seems to be saying to them, you haven't lost heart. It hasn't been easy because toiling implies it's not easy. Perseverance, persevering and patience doesn't imply it's been easy for them. But you've done that and you haven't become weary. You haven't lost heart. Right? Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 3. Hebrews 12 verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest what? Lest you become weary and discouraged in your heart. So it can happen, weary and discouraged in your souls. Consider Jesus Christ and what he went through, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls and where you just kind of throw in the towel and quit or try to hit the cruise control or I'm just going to coast or I can't do it anymore. We're going to reach those times where we're low and we're discouraged and feel overwhelmed, but we must keep doing good. We're going to reap if we don't lose heart. And they hadn't lost heart in these ways. They hadn't become weary. He then later commended them down in verse 6 again. He says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You remember, as we briefly pointed out there later in Revelation 2 with the compromising church at Pergamos or Pergamum, they did have some of those there who held to the doctrine of Balaam. And later he says, you have those in verse 15 who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. What do they hate? They hated the deeds. You hate the deeds. Of the he didn't say you hate the Nicolaitans, you hate the deeds because they were wrong. They were contrary to the will of Christ, the will of God. You know, this is not always, an, it's not always easy to do, and it's, it's less easy to have people think we hate only their deeds when they're condemned, right? I mean, we see that in the world all the time. The Bible condemns sin of fornication or adultery or homosexuality, and people, so if you, you speak against that, warning them to turn from that so that they'll be right with God. No, it's, it's not coming from a place of hate for the person, for the individual. We're to hate sin in our lives and evil in our lives because that's what separates us from God. God's love for us, he wants us to turn from sin, whatever that sin may be, and be right with him. But oftentimes that's the case, right? If, you, if that's condemned by God's word and someone hears that, well, you just hate me. No, I don't hate, we don't hate the individual. We hate the sin. We want you to be right with God. We want you to be saved. But Jesus also hated their deeds, which I also hate. He didn't say, I hate the Nicolaitans, nor did they. You, we, I hate their deeds. And so really we know nothing more, and we pointed this out with the church at Pergamos, we really know nothing more about that doctrine or the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But then we come to the condemnation. In verse 4, Christ said, nevertheless... He said all these positive things, all these good things about the church at Ephesus. And if we didn't have verses 4 and 5, we'd walk away. Now, this is a great church all around. And it was great and wonderful in many ways. But nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians was written, it's estimated around 62 A.D. And then at that time, he commended them for their love, Ephesians 1, verse 15. Now, more than 30 years later, think about that, 30 years have passed approximately, the Lord reproves them for having left their first love. Now, in form, this was still a quote-unquote sound church, right? What we read there, that's a sound church. They stand for truth. They stand against error. They fended off false doctrine, but the fire... In some way had gone out. They had abandoned their first love. They left it. It was an act of the will. 
you, ha you have left your first love. Think about the way that's worded. They had already completed the act of leaving. The honeymoon was over. The spiritual honeymoon was over. They had a great beginning, Acts 19, but their early love had cooled in spite of their ongoing doctrinal loyalty. You know, sound doctrine and hard work that's unbalanced by love and passion for Jesus ultimately is not acceptable. Right actions are of no value unless the motive is right as well. Isn't that exactly Paul's point there at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about love? About doing all these great things and all these wonderful things, but if it's void of love, then it's empty, it's, it's vain. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And so here are all these great accomplishments or great deeds or sacrifices, but it's void of love. It doesn't profit that person anything, ultimately, if love is absent. The Lord looks at not only what we do, but why we do it. The heart of it, the motive. The abandonment of their first love was not as discernible in activity as in attitude. What, what love had they left? Well, was it their love to God and to Jesus? Was it the love of the brethren? Was it love for lost souls? Maybe a combination of the three. I want to share with you some quotes from some various authors that I think do a good job in discussing this condemnation that Christ has for the church at Ephesus that they had left their first love. The expression first love is explained by the expression first works in verse 5. You might want to go back and look at that. They're told to repent and do their first works again. While they would not tolerate false teachers and false doctrines, yet their first early enthusiasm for the worship and progress of the church had waned. They were not as untiring in their devotion to the church as they were against false teaching. Happy is the Christian who does not allow his early zeal for worship and the spread of truth to burn low. The church of Ephesus had been established many years and their having lost their early spiritual fervor is not surprising when we remember the difficulty of holding a high level in anything. From Haley's commentary in Revelation, page 122, he writes, Love was still there as demonstrating the things commended, but the first love was lacking. We are not told specifically what that first love was. Was it... The love demonstrated in the burning of books of magic and mighty growth of the word of the Lord that we read about there in Acts 19? Was it love such as had been manifested toward Paul and their sorrow at his leaving them in Acts 20? Or was it the love shown for another, in the, probably one another, in the early years of the church commended in his letter to them? It may have been one or a combination of all these. Perhaps this loss of an early fiery devotion can be accounted for by the fact that the congregation was now in the second or third generation of his existence. This is always a dangerous period in the life of a church. At such a point, the youthful fiery fire of discovery and the enthusiasm of a glorious anticipation of future hopes too often begin to diminish. And then from Brother Robert Harkrider's workbook slash kind of commentary workbook, I actually, I, let me correct that. He wrote a book, wrote, wrote workbook, but also a commentary. This comes from his commentary on Revelation. He writes, Sound doctrine and hard work, unbalanced by love and passion for Jesus, would not carry them through the trials they would face. They no longer had the ardent vigor they held at first. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians was written about AD 62, 63, and at that time he thanked God for their faithfulness. 
By the time of this letter in Revelation, conditions in the church had changed. Now, more than 30 years later, the Lord reproves them for having left their first love and form. This was still a sound church which fended off false doctrine, but the fire had gone out. There is more to serving God than adherence to mechanical traditional routine. Like many modern second generation Christians who have, who have become members of the church only because their parents were members, Ephesus perhaps also harbored some inherited members who lacked the zeal that comes through sincere conversion. One cannot inherit faith. If one does not realize his own need for forgiveness of sins, the gift of salvation will be taken for granted. The Lord has no grandchildren, and those who claim to be part of Christ's church because their parents were members have never understood true conversion to Christ. On the other hand, an attitude of complacency is not true of all second-generation Christians. For many have been sincerely converted and are thankful to their parents for having taught them about Christ. Conversion must be within each individual's heart and not something handed down to them even from the most faithful of parents. Jesus said to them, you have left your first love. We need to remember the joy of conversion. And we don't, we're not going to take the time to go through all those scriptures. We need to remember the joy of, of worship, the joy of being a child of God. Remember your initial zeal that you had when you first learned the truth, first was baptized into Christ. That devotion, that steadfastness in serving the Lord, maybe that hasn't changed, but maybe for some of us it has. And so we have to examine ourselves, examine our faith and our love. Remember your enthusiasm and excitement, perhaps, to teach everyone around you, to share the good news with those that you encounter and meet, because you're so excited, so filled with love and joy and faith. Back in our text of Revelation 2, after the rebuke and condemnation by Christ, nevertheless, I've this against you, you've left your first love in verse 5. He says, remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Remember the way it used to be, from where you have fallen. That first love could yet be revived and experienced as at the first if they would recognize what had happened. One needs to remember how he felt when he obeyed the gospel and the thrill again of the joy of forgiveness, newness of life, the zeal, the fervency and spirit serving the Lord. He calls upon them to repent, an urgent appeal for an instant change of mind and conduct while there was still time. And the warning, the threat of removal of the lampstand, the church would lose its identity with the Lord. Now again in verse 5, let me call attention, repent and do what? Repent and do the first works. First works were those they performed in devotion to God soon after they obeyed the gospel. You know, new converts have an excitement, enthusiasm, oftentimes to teach everyone around them. And so the Lord wants them to return to this kind of unconditional zeal. And thus these three admonitions, remember, repent, return, they were exhorted to change their lives. But there comes a time in the life of every church when it should take a fresh inventory of its whole life and disposition in the sight of Christ. Remove your lampstand from its place, he says. It indicates that Christ rejects it because of its spiritual condition. The lampstand's purpose or place was to uphold and dispense light. But without the motivation of true love, it fails in its purpose and is therefore it no longer has a right to exist. A demand for repentance is repeated, and the verdict is repent or be removed. Unless you repent, this is what's going to happen. The promise to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To, he, he who, to him who overcomes, that's present tense, the Greek there, continuous victory, keeps on overcoming 
Overcoming is laid down in each of these letter, each letter to the seven churches of Asia as the basis for a reward. He who overcomes, right? We find that each one. What overcomes the world? Our faith, John says in 1 John 5, 4. Each church and each individual is continuously on trial. To eat of the tree of life, it's symbolic of eternal life. Remember, man's first home was in Eden, the Garden of Eden. But when Adam sinned, he was cut off from the tree of life. He and Eve were driven from the presence of the Lord, driven out of the garden, lest what? Lest he should reach out his hand, take it, and eat and live forever. But what man lost by sin in the Garden of Eden, where apparently the fruit of the tree of life signified fullness of life and immunity to death, it's now restored in Christ to him that overcomes sin. John later describes the tree of life in chapter 22 as being in the heavenly city. Paradise means a garden of pleasure. It's a Persian word and term. Jesus referred to it as the place where the spirits of the righteous reside after death in Luke 23, 43. But here it describes the place to which Jesus has gone to prepare an eternal home of the soul for the faithful. May we overcome that we may have granted access to the tree of life once again. First time the tree of life is mentioned in the, in the Bible is Genesis. Genesis. The next time it's mentioned is the last book, Revelation. If you will, let us prepare our minds for the invitation of the Lord. Hope you've enjoyed and benefited from the study of the seven churches of Asia. I know I have personally in my preparations, and I trust that we all have, and that will benefit individually and also as a local church as we continue to study and examine through the years that God gives us these messages that Christ personally gives to these seven churches of Asia. We read of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, studied it with the junior high and high school class this morning, and Philip preached Jesus to him. And so he saw water, and he says, what hinders me from being baptized? Well, if you believe with all your heart, you... You may. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and he baptized him. Now when they come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. That joy, that love, that excitement, that zeal, when we first believed, when we first obeyed. We have some in the audience who have not yet done that. But maybe this morning you're ready to do so, to surrender your will to his will, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that you are willing to repent of your sins and, as the eunuch did, confess your faith in him and to be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away, Acts 22:16, 16, and to be able to go on your way rejoicing. Not that that's it. Have a great life. That's the beginning. You're a new creature. You've been born again. That's the beginning of your spiritual journey, to continue to worship with God's people and to grow in your faith and to share the good news with others, what you have learned and what you have done. But if you're ready to have that kind of joy, the best joy that you can possibly have, saved from your sins, a child of God, then we stand ready to assist you. If you've done that but you've left your first love or there's some other sin in your life that we can pray with you and for you, whatever spiritual need you may have, would you let us know, please, as we stand and as we sing.